Okay, so here's the next point about battle of integration. It's a way, I just was describing how you can take your own temperature, you can diagnose yourself where you are in the battle of integration by the sequencing and the frequency. How often do you think about God when you're doing something? And then how quickly in the sequence of things do you think about Him? Okay, if you find yourself thinking about Him frequently during the day, then you're you're on your way. You're in the right direction. You're growing, for sure. If you find yourself not wanting to do that, then you're retrogressing. If you find yourself not doing that, then you got a problem. Okay? And you can have a problem being mature. You can have a problem being totally immature. Like that. These are the, these symptoms that I'm talking about. They happen in all stages of spiritual life. So you can't say, well, I'm mature because of this behavior or that behavior. Because you're always going to be mature on certain areas and immature on certain other areas. But overall, what you want to look at in yourself, if, you, if you're interested to know this, I mean, frankly, if you're just interested in God, you won't be paying attention to this either. If you're curious to know how far along you are, ask yourself, how often do I think of God during the day? And ask God to remind you to do that. Okay? To remind you to use 1 John 1, 9. To remind you to think about Him. To re just plain remind you of Him. He will. Okay? And and that's a spiritual function. And, it, you know, you can't make yourself do it. You can wish for it all, you know, until you're blue in the face. But you can't make yourself do it. So ask Him. And then when it comes to your mind, the question about Him. You know, then it's your opportunity to say, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Dad. All right. Now, that same procedure for you as an individual can also be used to di diagnose society as a whole in their battle for integration. And that's really important because you need to know what time it is. It's a central doctrine in the Bible that, you know, people sort of know, but they don't pay enough attention to. Remember when Christ was sitting, and they even did it in the movies, the Jesus of Nazareth movie in particular, where he says, how can you know, you know, when, when the tree is bringing forth leaves, you know that it's summer is near. So how come you don't know what times these are? In other words, how come you don't know that I'm Messiah? Yeah, because everything in the Bible predicted his exact date of birth and everything about him beforehand. So that you could be sure you weren't hallucinating that he was Messiah. Because there would be a lot of those who claim to be Messiah. Because the promise of Messiah is the whole core of the Old Testament. That was the promise to Abraham. When it's saying to Abraham the promise of sons, it's talking about the son. That's why Abraham was excited about it. I mean, you know, come on. What good does it do to have kids? If you like rearing kids, that's one thing. But, you know, what's the point? Does it really matter if those kids come out of your body or somebody else's body? If you like kids, you like kids. Okay, so why couldn't he have adopted somebody? But that wasn't the issue. The promise God made to him was that the son would come from his loins. That's what he was all concerned about. Okay, so the battle of integration then is a question of being concerned about God and in society in general, the interest or the, what you want, want to call it, gossip about God tells you where society is. Okay, and you have to sort of really pay attention to all of the issues in a society and all the positions in a society because a lot of time society will say rah rah God rah rah Jesus especially Christians and God doesn't mean anything to them at all 
and they're dead giveaways. Okay? Just like the sequencing thing. For example, in every generation of the Jews and of the Christians, you will have loud, loud, loud contingents saying, oh, how important God is and how religious they are and they bob at the wailing wall or they rub their beads and they're saying, God this, God that, God the other thing. Real loud. But then you look at some of the rest of the stuff that they either promote or believe is valid. Like, all these Christians who are pro-lifers, pro-life is totally anti-Bible. You're aborting the word if you're pro-life. Period. And when confronted with the bald evidence in Bible that that is true, the pro-lifer will yell at the, the presenter, me in this case. Oh, you're lying. No, here's the Bible verse. Here's the actual text. Here's the videos where I show the actual text and the lexicons in Bible works. So I didn't write it. It's not an opinion. It's the text, live, on screen. Oh, that, yeah, you're wrong. No, it's not me. This isn't even about me. This is its text. If I showed you the sun in the sky, you wouldn't tell me it was my opinion. You would be saying, oh, that's the sun in the sky, whether you liked it or not. But when it comes to Bible, and you show actual text, and the person doesn't like it, then they have to blame you. Because they can't blame it. It's proving them wrong. Right in its own words. And they can't admit that. So what does that tell you? That tells you that all of their, oh God this, and rah rah Jesus, and rah rah Bible is a bunch of lies. Right there. Because if you like the Bible and you like God, and someone shows you something in the Bible, and you say it's not true, when the text is staring you in the face then it's the Bible you've got a problem with. It's God you've got a problem with. And all your protestations about how you love Jesus are just so much bupkis. But there are more subtle ways. Okay? For example, and this is really embarrassing. This is the culture I grew up in. In 1950s and 1960s America, well, 1940s, 50s, maybe even you could say the 30s, America, from 30s to the 1950s. We practice something that makes me throw up to this day, just to think about it. It was called segregation. Somehow the idea that mindless melanin, which turns in different colors depending on where your ancestry comes from, that that determines whether you're better or worse than someone else. I have never heard anything so ridiculously stupid in my life. And in the United States, which in those days was extremely outwardly devout in terms of going to church, okay, they were as prejudiced as, it, as you can get. They were prejudiced against the Chinese or any Asians. They were prejudiced against the brown people. They were prejudiced against the black people. They were prejudiced against the yellow people. They were prejudiced against any color but white. And of course, all those people who are still alive today like cockroaches are all behind Donald Trump. They think he's the greatest thing since white bread. Now I'm white. White Anglo-Saxon Protestant can trace my lineage all the way back to the daughters of the American Revolution. whoop de doo And that means absolutely nothing. But when you're insecure and you're sick in your head, and you hate God and you hate Bible, you grab onto other gods instead, like skin color. And what's hysterical about all this is there's no such thing as a white person. You know that? There really isn't. There's no such thing as a black person. There's no such thing as a yellow person. There's no such thing as a brown person. In fact, 
I bet if you could do it, if we could find his body, you know, because Abraham is buried in Macpella, wherever that is, and, you know, people tell you that, oh, this is the cave of Macpella. You don't really know that. Okay. If we could find what we knew to be the real Abram's gene, you know, skin, bones, anything, because you can get DNA from anything, and we extract the DNA, I would bet you that 97% of the human population, if not more, has at least one of those genes in it. In other words, we could be provably traced back to Abraham. He's the second Noah. So you had Adam, the first guy. Everybody comes from Adam. Then it all boiled down to Noah and his, and his, you know, three sons and their wives. Okay, so then including Noah's wife, that'd be eight people. Okay, and everybody can be traced if we could find those bones to those eight people. Okay, then it all comes down to Abraham. And God said to Abraham that your kids will be innumerable. Now, he was talking in two ways. Kids due to bloodline and kids due to faith. Doing what Abraham did, Genesis fifteen six. Abraham believed in the Lord and it was accredited to his account as righteousness. Okay, if you did that, you're already a son of Abraham. That's Paul's big point in Galatians 3. Okay, fine. But I wouldn't be surprised. And it's speculation, but it's plausible. That, you know, God loving the pun and the joke, that because the Jews and the Arabs are so prolific with their sexual activity, that pretty much everybody on the planet has at least one of Abraham's genes in them. Which actually justifies your being alive. Because of the promise God made to Abraham, doesn't matter what a scallywag you are. He made that promise to Abraham. He wants to keep it. So therefore you get to live. It would not surprise me at all. Okay, but now we come back to this whole business about, you know, the battle of integration. God is just pretend what I just said is true. So then God has integrated Abram's blood in everybody in the human race. Or we'll say 97% to allow for a margin of error. You know, because God doesn't gerrymander freedom. Okay? All right. So then all these people... In the 1930s through the 1960s, talking about white supremacy, and of course the ones doing it today, okay, all these people are so dumb, they don't even know there's no such thing as a white person. Even the blacks in the deepest parts of Africa are probably 25% white because of all the men are mingling going on in the Levant, where Israel is, over the centuries, period. Okay? I mean, theoretically, it might be possible that somebody is, you know, 90% one race or another. But, like, good luck trying to find who. Okay? So every argument about race is pathetic. Because whatever race you claim to be, you're not. And whatever race you claim you're not, you probably are. Now, if you really cared about God and Bible, like the people in the 1930s to the 1960s claimed, then you wouldn't have those concerns. Race wouldn't be an issue to you. Christ himself had every single kind of race running through his own veins. People just don't do their own work. And of course, he didn't have any kids. But... Where did he get those genes? From his mother. And his mother was Mary. And she had kids. At least six others. And I don't know, two sisters at least. I think, I think that's right. At least six sons and two... And two um, daughters. And it would have been a sin for her not to. Because she's royal family. You don't deny your husband sex. That's a sin. Okay. And then Paul even talks about that somewhere. Your wife, the husband's body belongs to the wife. The wife's body belongs to the husband. Okay? And, you know, talk to God about this. He'll, he'll verify it. The point is, is that if you really care about God and if you really care about the Bible, then what you don't care about are the outers. 
one of which is skin color, let alone race. So the fact that in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, everybody was segregated, at least in the United States and to some extent elsewhere, but in the United States it was particularly bad. That tells you that the Bible meant nothing to those people. That all their claims about God was just so much, I don't know, window dressing. And the funny thing is, is that the people who did care about Bible a lot were the blacks. They really put, uh, you know, when you be, when you go back and you look at that period in, in U.S. history, a really dark stain in American history. When you go back and you look at that, and you see the the faith that the blacks had, and a lot of sound Bible teaching and some goofball Bible teaching, of course, but they were genuine about it. Okay, I wouldn't be surprised if in once we're in heaven that God says, you know, this is what held the U.S. together were the black people. Because they waited for God to deliver them. They didn't make a stink about, you know, their rights. It wasn't until icky, stupid, disgusting Martin Luther King came along that they made an issue of their rights. He was bad. He was just totally bad. I, I don't care what anybody says. Because the man, oh, he wouldn't know God if it bit him. God used it anyhow to free those who weren't protesting, to free those who were waiting on God to deliver them out of Egypt, so to speak. Martin Luther King was wrong. He was a, he was just, everything about that man was just evil beyond description. But God used it. Okay. The same thing was true for the whole business with the Civil War. There should have never been a Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was a jerk. He's sitting there going to tell the states what rights that they have. Are they making wrong laws? Yeah. And a whole lot of people, what they did is they bought black slaves, not because they wanted slaves so much as because they wanted to give them, you know, a happier life. And it was the only way they could do it. And then they either freed them at certain age or they gave them conditions that were just like as if they were free. Slavery is an evil thing. Just totally evil. But, okay, it's even more evil for one part of your nation to go after your rights when it's not the nation's right to go after you. Okay, so Lincoln was more evil than the evil that was being practiced in the South. And there was evil being practiced in the South. And the South was actually talking about getting rid of slavery. Because that's one of the big problems of slavery. Rome went through the same thing. Once you have a lot of slaves, okay, it it burdens the economy so much. Slavery is a real burden. And it's just evil all the way around. It just, it just mucks up everything. Okay, but that's the point. Here we were back during the Civil War times too. Oh, we love Jesus. We didn't know squat about Jesus. And the amazing thing about that time too is where the black church got started is that there were some who didn't agree with the slavery thing. And they might have had money and they purchased, you know, slaves, but they treated them like free persons and they gave them the gospel. And the gospel took off like wildfire. Just took off amongst the blacks. And I, I maintain that's what preserved the United States. Because the whites sure weren't doing it. We were disloyal to God. And we were disloyal to God in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And you can just bet that's one reason why we had all those wars. 1870, World War I, World War II are all kind of a set piece. It's, it's, it's like fight, rest, fight, rest. Because they all come out of the same thing. And it's really not over yet. So the people who alleged to support God in the Bible, obviously the battle of integration there is going against, going against them.
because it was revealed. I mean, not not revealed like in a prophetic sense, but if you're paying attention, you say, "Oh, here are all these church-going people, but they believe in segregation." Seriously. Something's rotten in Denmark. Now you can tell, oh, that's why God let the Depression occur. That's why God let World War I occur even before that. Because the Depression was an outgrowth of World War I. That's why God let World War II occur. And prejudice is the big, is the big hallmark of that period of time. Prejudice against the Jews. Prejudice against the Asians. Prejudice against anybody not white. It was all about white supremacy during that period, all over the world. And that proves that all that rah-rah Jesus stuff was one great big lie. So the battle of integration was not being won by the entities, by the nations and their populations who claim to be Christian. That's really what the fall of Western civilization, that was, you know, really what caused it. Prejudice. And not merely that prejudice, but all the other association prejudices with it. In other words, we're white and we're supreme and therefore our culture and our norms and our customs are supreme. And look at what those cultures and customs and were. Totally disgusting. Utterly and positively disgusting. You spend hours upon hours figuring out what you're going to wear to dinner. And then you have this little rule for how you lift your glass. And this little rule for how you lift your fork. And this little rule for how you lift your teacup. And you get to talk about this at dinner, but not that. And you, st and you sit straight up and your back never rests against the chair. And all these rules and rules and rules about behavior. For the amount of time that you had to spend learning all those rules, you could have been learning scripture instead. Why weren't they doing that? So much for their alleged love for Jesus. And the little homily that the pastor spoke at the end. And he stands at the back of the church and he has to shake each hand. And every woman is thinking about every other woman's clothing and whether you're wearing a racy hat to church. Those are all forms of prejudice. Our class, our Lord and Lady class. And I mean, I'm interested in programs like Downton Abbey and Upstairs, Downstairs as much as anyone else. But I, I, I can't watch them without thinking about, wow, how apostate these Christians were. Apostate. Total apostasy. That you spend so much time on manners and outers and behavior. And we call that civilization. We dare to call that civilization. That's rottenness. And the same thing afflicted Israel. See, the battle of integration in your own life, you learn on the inside about whether your thoughts are sequencing properly. And if you're interested in getting them to sequence properly, obviously it's a practice game like piano. You, you fail and you do it over again. You fail and you do it over again. And when society is not doing it over again, because failure is inevitable. Okay? That, that's, that, you know, you exercise to the point of failure. That's how exercise is beneficial to you. You exercise until you can't do it anymore. So you practice this thing with trying to learn and live on Bible to you fail and you'll catch yourself failing. And instead of being demoralized, it's like, okay, I had my exercise. Then get up and do it again. Get up and do it again. Society, that's a grueling thing to do. Society won't do it. And the proof that society fails, the proof that society is hypocritical. It's all over the place. 
I gave the example of prejudice in the 1930s through the 50s, but you can look at pretty much anything else. False doctrine teaching, that's a good example. Here's the Bible, it's right in front of you. Why do you have to make it up? Here's the Bible, the verses are right in front of you. The text is plain. How can you be pro-life? You're lying against scripture, flat. You might as well be a Muslim. How can anybody say that Jesus isn't God? When he says he's God 50 times in John 8 alone, he can't pay for sins unless he's God. It won't work. As Paul puts it, what was that? Second Timothy 2.15 or thereabouts. Hi, God, hi, what was it? Hi, hi, God, Deus, Christ, Messites. It's around Second Timothy two fifteen. In English, that means um, God is God is one, therefore one mediator, and He's making a play on the fact that He's God Man. That was a thought that Christ had in His head that Paul is quoting, which was not known to anybody until Paul quoted it. Okay, that's what Christ's own reasoning was for becoming the mediator, for wanting to be the Christ. God is one, therefore here I am, one mediator, ha ha. It's a joke, it's a kind of joke. Okay, so that's his use of Bible to resolve the integration, to create the integration, winning the battle of the integration. Okay, so how can anybody say that Jesus Christ is not God? It's not possible. How can anybody not be Trinitarian? But then the Trinitarian definitions are all wrong, too. All of them. The Catholic Unicity definition, probably the worst, although the Westminster Confession is pretty bad. They would have you think that God was a hydra-headed monster. That one God being whole cannot live apart from the other two. Yes, he can. That's the whole point. Three co-equal, co-eternal, and we should call them gods. It's not polytheism. Three with the same nature, persons. That means gods, plural, hello. Polytheism is where they have different abilities and none of them are co-equal or co-eternal. That's what polytheism is. And really that's more like, you know, demons or something. Oh, the spirit of the spring. Oh, the spirit of the trees. Oh, we got Thor. Of course, forget the modern movies about Thor. In the real ancient myth, Thor was, you know, he, he had a powerful hammer. And he had certain powers, but other, other gods had other powers. So none of them was all powerful. You see the difference? Big difference. Okay, but in the battle of integration, we don't care what the truth is. In the battle of integration, we make up our own ideas and slap God's name on them. So in the battle of integration, even when we have the truth in our mouths, even when we have the truth in our pulpits, it doesn't sink through. And we have, for example, prejudices. Now you look out today and you'll see the same thing occurring. A denomination is a form of prejudice. Our ideas are right and everybody else is wrong. Or our ideas are more right than your ideas. If it's true, it's not your idea. If it's true, it's God's idea, and you get the privilege of knowing it. But that doesn't make you a better person than someone else, because God gives out His truth to everybody. So the more you know of His truth, the happier you should be, and the less in need of prejudice. A thing is untrue, or a thing is true. Is Catholicism true? No. That's not prejudice against Catholicism, it's a fact that you can prove from Scripture. 
But the Catholics, well, they're prejudiced that Catholicism is true. Because they just say so. They don't have any facts to prove them right. They have opinion after opinion of their own kind. We're right, we're right, we're right, we're right, we're right. Yeah, you just keep on saying that, but it doesn't make it true. See the difference? So prejudice lives on, requires lies. Okay, so then if you're living on prejudice, then you're not living on Bible. If you're living on prejudice, you're not living on God. If you have prejudice, then you're not integrated with God. And the battle of integration is being lost. Now the biggest thing to notice about that, if the battle of integration, if, if the battle of integration is being lost by those around you, by your society, by the world as a whole, and generally speaking that's true, then you can expect bad times. And when it gets too bad that the, what do you want to call it, the infection of prejudice is too high, then wars occur. And of course we just started. Uh, I mean, I haven't said this before, but now I'm beginning to really suspect that World War Three started last July on the 100th anniversary of World War I. It started, the, the event that I'm thinking of is the takeover of ISIS. ISIS taking over Mosul. Okay. Um, some might argue that it began in January of 2015, but I'm, I'm going to kind of stick with July. It didn't have to begin then, but it started. You can argue it started sometime in the last half of last year. When we pulled our troops out and the the, you know, what do you call it, the so-called radical Arabs came in. That's when it started. We should have stayed there. We shouldn't have pulled out. Okay, every time America pulls, once you go in, once America goes in, she should never pull out. Okay, when we pulled out of Vietnam, Chaos occurred. We wasted all the lives of people I even knew. Because we pulled out. When we pulled out of Afghanistan, when we pulled out of Iraq, we wasted the lives of our good soldiers who were there. And of course a lot of civilian casualties too. Those are wars you don't leave. You can't. God always said, there will be wars and rumors of wars until I come. Where did he say that? What was the area he was talking about? The Middle East. So once we go in, we don't get out. But if you're prejudiced against Bible, then you're prejudiced about a lot of things. And then you don't understand truth at all. Because you don't want to. You want your hallucinated stuff to be true. But you can hallucinate until you're blue in the face. And you might even be right to want a particular thing to be true. But it doesn't make it true. I always want to be a ballerina. I can't. Got the long legs. But... I'm a klutz. Whenever I dance, everybody would laugh. I mean, that kind of dancing. There's some things you can hallucinate. I can hallucinate being a ballerina by closing my eyes. Doesn't make it true. Maybe you have some occupation that you wanted to be. Something else you wanted to be. Oh, if only I could be blah, blah, blah. Well, you can close your eyes and imagine it. But that isn't going to make it true. But at least that's close. Okay, you can hallucinate all day long that, that you know, the Arabs really want peace. They don't. They never have. They've always been fighting with each other or Israel 
or anybody else in that periphery. They love fighting. They love killing each other. They're very childish and stupid and disgusting and sickening. Except for, of course, you know, one or two or three percent of them. And largely because, only because they got westernized. And the West was just as bad as the Arabs before the Bible became our thought pattern. The Bible is the Western cultural thought pattern. We don't accredit it as such, but it really is. All the rules and ideas in it are very much watered down and twisted, but that is the source of Western culture. Otherwise, we were just like the Arabs, running around worshipping trees. Okay. Worshipping the sun, the moon, and the stars. So the human race is prejudiced pro-lies. Pro-hallucination. That's the battle of integration, is to deintegrate from that and reintegrate into the truth. But we don't want truth. We'd rather hallucinate. And even in Christianity, the norm is to twist what Bible says. The question is how badly. And if you look out at your society today, okay, you can tell whether or not, and that's why it's happening, war is imminent. Because of the prejudice, essentially, and that prejudice first is against God and against Scripture. Therefore, get this, as a result, because it's against God, because it's against Bible, therefore it becomes against the Jews. It becomes against other peoples. In other words, if you're Arab, then everybody not Arab, you get prejudice against. If you're an Arab Christian. If you're an Indonesian Christian, you get prejudice against everybody who's not an Indonesian Christian. If you're going south in your spiritual life. Prejudice is a distinctive characteristic of somebody whose spiritual life is really gone south. My pastor called that reversionism. And it's really interesting bringing up this characteristic about prejudice because he's a child of that 1930s, 40s, 50s and he used to be mildly but still he used to be somewhat prejudiced I mean the, the prejudice can take the form of oh they're uh, how do you want to call it? a lot of whites in America consider blacks to be a childish people Okay, and it was debated whether this childishness in blacks was permanent or a characteristic of the race. And I remember when my pastor was talking in the 1960s, and you can still hear him in those early classes, where he sort of gave in to that. But somewhere along the line, God grew him out of it. I don't know why I could point to any particular date when he grew out of it, but there was a point when he just didn't even think like that anymore. It's really interesting to see how his spiritual life was transformed while he's teaching. So you can see what the Word of God does to you the more you learn it. Okay? Because he started out Mr. Macho Man, Mr. you know, classic white supremacist, but nice. Okay? And he became an entirely different person. Well, not entirely different, but matured out of it. Matured out of those quirks. At the end of his life, all he cared about was God. In fact, it drove the congregation to distraction, because that's all he wanted to talk about was God. No more about the politics, because he used to be a political firebrand. No more about religion, because he used to be a religion firebrand. He used to be a Calvinist, for crying out loud. Grew out of all that. That's what the spiritual life does to you. That's how it ba- the battle of integration plays. In the individual, and he's a really good example of what it can do to you. 
when God matures you out of the, the kind of vicissitudes that you go through and the kind of changes you go through. Okay? And the same thing is true for a nation, a region, an area. So if your area is, what do you want to call it, remarkably um, prejudiced, then it's remarkably retarded spiritually. Whether it's because they don't believe at all, um, or because they did believe and now they're, you know, rejecting God, which is more likely. You should be able to determine. But, you know, when you find yourself in that kind of a, uh, an environment, then you might want to ask God, okay, am I in the right place? Maybe you are, because you're the only blessing they'll get. Blessing by association, okay? But maybe he wants you to move out. It's the same story as Sodom and Gomorrah, basically. So the battle of integration can play on the losing level. Then you have to know, because you have to decipher the times that you're in. Okay, Dad, I'm. Um, everybody around me is really kind of goofball. Maybe you have to leave your family. Maybe you have to leave your town. Maybe you have to leave your country. And just as possible, okay, the reverse. Maybe you have to stay there because they're going south and they need you. The Bible provides both examples, okay? Jeremiah is an example of the latter case. Jeremiah was surrounded by everybody going down. He knew they were going down. It was his job for 40 years to tell them that they were going down. Israel, you're going to be taken over by Nebuchadnezzar. That was his job, to tell them that. And that's one reason Nebuchadnezzar spared Jeremiah. Because he found that out. But, you know, the kings of Israel hated him for saying that. And they even threw him into a sewer. It's called cistern in the King James. But it, it means sewer. Okay? They threw him into a sewer. How dare you say speak against the king that way? And Jeremiah said, God's telling me to say this. Okay, well, the king was prejudiced against God, and no, nobody's going to come, and we're wonderful, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, down you go. So maybe God is hiring you to stay in the group amidst all that growing prejudice against him. Or maybe he wants to move you out to somewhere else because of the information in you, salt of the earth. Okay? Because for God to judge the area, just like the Sodom and Gomorrah story, and really kind of just like um, Jeremiah's story too, because Jeremiah ended up being moved out. Forced. He was literally forced. Some Jews took him out of Israel and took him, I want to say it was to Egypt or somewhere, for a while. They literally carried him there. He didn't want to go. Because he knew he was supposed to stay there. But they, they forcibly took him. I, I think that was the story. Check with God. The point is, is that you might have to be taken out. And it might be forcibly like Jeremiah was. Or it might be that you're supposed to ask God and go. Because he has someplace else he wants you to go. And that story is illustrated by Paul. Where you're supposed to leave. God gave Paul ministry to the Gentiles, not the Jews. Okay? If anybody should have been a Pope, it should have been Paul. Because God gave him that ministry. And Paul himself admits that's what God had done in Acts 22. But Paul didn't like it. Paul wanted to be have his ministry to the Jews who were apostate, who were refusing, even once they believed in Christ, refusing what the new spiritual life meant. Because now that Christ is risen, the, the Mosaic Law is completed. And that's, of course, what Paul was writing in the book of Romans. Well, it's during the writing of the book of Romans that he starts to go negative to God. 
And my pastor was, you know, he did a series on this called Paul's Fall in 1992 Spiritual Dynamics Series 376, um, lesson 1541 and following. Paul goes native. God is ordering Paul to leave. He goes negative to that. And he starts rationalizing. God is ordering Paul to leave and go to Rome. And Paul is rationalizing as he writes to the Romans. Because he's supposed to go there. So he's writing instead because he doesn't want to go there. So by Romans 15, he's sort of rationalizing. Well, I think I'll go to Macedonia and pick up the money so I can go to Jerusalem. And then I'll come see you after by way of Spain or something. He's, he's, he's trying to ditch God's will for his life there. Okay? He's trying to ditch it. So, when you're ordered by God to leave, you better do it. Because God will take you out, as he did to Paul in chains, which Paul finally confessed to in Acts 22. Okay. He writes Romans before Acts, obviously. And, you know, <laughs> that's the next thing you need to know, is like in this battle of integration. God's got a will for your life as to where you ought to be, what you ought to be doing at any moment. And it's always to your best interest to find out what that is, because that'll be the most enjoyable thing. It won't feel good, but it'll be most enjoyable in terms of benefits. Now, once you find out, oh, all these people are prejudiced around me. Should I stay or should I go? You're going to have your own desires, too. And that's the battle of integration for you. You'll want to stay or you'll want to go. And maybe wanting to stay is what God wants to. And maybe wanting to go is what God wants to. And so maybe you're agreeing and God is agreeing, or maybe you're not. Well, see, that's your integration problem. See? Isn't this cute? The battle for integration tells you the public temperature. The battle for integration tells you your private temperature. And if the battle for integration is revealing in the public temperature, that maybe you better get the hell out of Dodge. Do you want to get the hell out of Dodge? Or are you supposed to stay there? And do you want to stay there? And is what you want the same thing as what God wants? Well, that's an opportunity for integration with you. And notice how in both cases, Jeremiah's case, where he knew he was supposed to stay there, and Paul's case, where he knew he was supposed to go but didn't want to. Same thing as jo uh, Jonah. God did the doing. God saved Paul by the means of the Roman, ha uh ha, -huh, pun, by means of the Roman who rescued Paul. God saved Jeremiah, who was and did obey, staying in Israel. But God rescued Jeremiah by having the Jews who were not obeying God take him out. Jeremiah couldn't do anything about it. So Jeremiah was doing what he was supposed to do. God wanted him to be with those Jews because they weren't obeying God. So in essence, he, they took Israel with them. Okay? And again, you know, check with God on the details because I'm talking off the top of my head here. I feel very uncomfortable with some of the things I'm saying. So, you know... In, the battle for integration is an inner and an outer thing. The outer gives you the public temperature and indicates maybe if you need to have a change of location. So it's important because the geographical will of God really matters. And in either event, whether you're getting it right or you're getting it wrong, God will make sure that's the overriding will of God, God will make sure to protect you if you keep on wanting to know Him. Because the battle for integration is never 100% accurate. 
even when you're saying yes to God and you really mean it, you're not saying yes 100% of the time. And so to the rest of the world, as prejudiced as the world was in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, and that's why we had those depressions and wars. In large measure, not total, but in large measure. For all that prejudice and all that hypocrisy and all that negativity to Bible and God, which generated all the prejudice, there were some things that they really did care about. There were some elements where the Bible really did matter to them. And one of the things that the wars and the depression helped accomplish was to reify and, how do you want to call it, separate the interest in God from the non-interest. A lot of people learned through all that suffering of those years. To separate out the interest in God from the cultural milieu. Okay? Because a lot of people believe in God because it's part of the culture. Not because of Him. Because that's what they grew up with. Because it's familiar. Because it feels good. Instead of it being because of Him. And so all that uproar helped people get over their, as it were, prejudice of wanting God because of the culture. Rather than just wanting God. Okay? And a whole lot of stories could be told. You know, about how that separation occurred. But I, I think I'm going to ask you to ask God about those stories. Because that way you'll understand that he's the one telling this story instead of me. And he knows what of the other stories of this period you need to see. But it's real important in, in what's upcoming, especially because we probably just started in World War III. Exactly because of the same problem. The cultural temperature all over the world is prejudice. Okay, you've got two basic cultures at war right now. The Islamic and the White West. Okay, now it turns out that a whole lot of people who aren't white identify with Western culture for their own reasons, which is a good thing. But the whites in particular are feel threatened because so much of Western culture now doesn't require you to be white. They feel like they're a dying group. whoop de doo Ideas don't belong to any race. They're gods, okay, if they're right. And the Islamic culture, of course, is also threatened because it's wrong. Everything about it is wrong. And a whole lot of people who are Muslims are finding out how wrong it is, and they don't want it anymore. And so all this shakeup of prejudice is occurring. And that's when war happens, so that people can get free or get canned, you know, get clobbered. So that the world can be free up of the prejudice and start over. So talk to God about this battle of integration because that's really what's going on now. It's probably going to characterize the rest of the century. Peace out.